we are very careful to never dictate to students what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, but encourage them to think about these questions for themselves. Because at the end, this actually isn't about Bitcoin. This isn't about Bitcoin education. This is about what that encourages, what that incentivizes. If our ultimate goal is to encourage people to think for themselves, then it's important that we don't tell them what to think, right? That they have to come to their own conclusion. So we try to prompt that. We try to prompt the right questions, but the students actually come to their own conclusions. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm here with John. And uh, this one's going to be really fun because you are doing some fascinating and important work. And I can't wait to dive in. So welcome to the show, John. Thank you so much for having me. So we had a, a chat down in Miami and you just showed me the course material and the workbook that you guys teach. I was blown away because I've never seen something just so well organized and just thoughtful in the way that this is laid out. And I just, some of the stories you were telling me about what was happening in the classroom were just fascinating. And I just couldn't wait to have this conversation with you. I guess my first question for you is what, what started you down this journey to do this nonprofit and set this up in El Salvador? Like what was the impetus for this? Yeah. So I'm from New York originally, and I happened to be there when the pandemic hit, that would have been early 2020. And it was an interesting time to be alive, right? It was an interesting yeah. time to be in New York. And I had a lot of free time. <laughs> so I spent that pondering the world, right? Like thinking it seemed very clear that we were on the wrong path. It seemed as clear as ever that we were on the wrong path. So I, I spent a lot of time having pretty negative thoughts, to be honest, thinking about like what the logical conclusions are to the path that we're currently on. And then it kind of dawned on me that there is there is a hope, there is something that we can do. And I think Bitcoin symbolizes that for me. So during the pandemic, I thought, okay, we're on the wrong path, but Bitcoin could be a way to get on the right path. And, and the reason why I say that we're on the wrong path and Bitcoin could be the right path is because I think one of the main things that that is important to me is critical thinking, is self-sovereignty, is have an agency in our own lives. Uh, and it was as obvious as ever that we had lost that, that we had gone away from that. And I think Bitcoin naturally brings us back to those values. So that was that was in my head already. By the tail end of the pandemic, I had moved back to Ecuador, which is a place that I had spent years in previously. Uh, and I thought that I wanted to help people learn about Bitcoin there. Ecuador was a much different place than New York. It was a place that needed it more than New York and that I thought would be more open to change because they weren't at the at the top of the pecking order in the financial system. So I I, I gave I gave a little bit of, of Bitcoin to to some people to teach other neighbors, coworkers, tried to get something started. It didn't really get any traction. Part of that was the pandemic was still going on and this was focused on like interactive in-person stuff. Um, but I kind of forgot about it. And then a few months later, then El Salvador announced that they were adopting Bitcoin as legal tender, which was a really, uh, it, it, it like shook me, right? Like it, yeah. it was in disbelief, to be honest. Like it took me a few days to come around like that. This is, this is real. This is really happening. Uh, I'm very interested in Latin America. I'm very interested in Bitcoin. Both of them have made up good portions of, of my adult life focusing on these two things. And this is Bitcoin Latin America. And it was not on my radar, right? I was mm -hmm. like, okay, wow, this is, this is, a, this is an earthquake. Uh, and then, so I thought, okay, I want to help. I want to do something to make sure that El Salvador will be a success. So I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there. I'm going to live there. Uh, and then from that, it was like, well, what should I do? And then it was like, well, I wonder if this education thing, I wonder if that would have more traction in El Salvador. So I went there after having some initial 
some initial analysis, conversations with friends, just trying to work through some stuff, but not having any idea if it would be successful, if it would get any traction, if if anybody else would think it was a good idea. Um, so yeah, I, I arrived in in August 2021, shortly before the law went into effect, with not that much more than an idea. You know, there was a website and like a mission statement and some basic stuff, but um, yeah, and, and and really, really, it's it's taken off because it's attracted the right people. Mm-hmm. Uh, both both here on the ground, the people that that teach these courses, the people that develop the next courses, um, the people that that create the financial infrastructure. Like they're just really wonderful people that are committed to this idea. And and then outside of El Salvador, you know, like just even coming on this podcast and and helping with that. Like it's 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 really taken on a life of its own since then. John, I can tell you, honestly, the course material is off the charts, phenomenal. Um, Having gone through it, like every single page in the course material, it's phenomenal. Um, How how many students have you guys had go through the program at this point? Yeah. So we actually have a few different offerings. So we started out with just intro classes. So in 2021, it was just intro classes, just a a 90-minute one-off what is money? Mm-hmm. Why do we need to change it? And then what is Bitcoin? Which is effectively what the Bitcoin diploma is, right? It's just a longer version of that, explaining how we arrived at this moment, like the history of money, how we've gotten here, and then how Bitcoin could be an alternative to that. So with the intro classes, we've had much more students. We had 400 in 2021. We had 10,000 in 2022. And this year, we have as many as 5,000 per month now. Um, per month, five thousand per month. So they're, yeah, they're they're dialing in via video to go through the. No, this is all in person. No way. Yeah, this is all in person, and, and then so the Bitcoin diploma is something that is a little bit newer. It's about a year old at this point. Uh, it was developed in twenty twenty two, and that's that ten week program that you know the course material that you had seen, and we that has doubled every. The number of students has more than doubled every session that we do. So every like 10 week period. So we started with 38, then we did 100, 200, 500. Uh, The the group that had just graduated that that cohort, um, you know, we're teaching it in different places, but a similar timeline, like we start and finish around the same time. The one that just finished that group was 500 students. Uh, So... The next one will these be... numbers are massive for in person. These numbers are massive. Yeah, I had I didn't know the numbers were that huge. That that's that's okay. Um here's where I want to go with this. So you have this course material, like one of the very first pages in the course material is and how many pages is it? Uh hold on here. I have it open. It's 104 pages. One of the first pages in the it's a little longer now, I think you're gonna say well, something. yeah, we we uh we're always with with each new group, we try to learn from the previous one and, and update it. So the one that will be coming out, well, the English version is already out, but the Spanish version that will be coming out soon is, is I think we added like 60 or 70 pages to it. Wow. And I mean, it is high quality uh, content you guys got in here. It's not filler, that's for sure. Um, whenever I look at the course material, one of the very first pages is this... Uh, blank page and it says Hmm. uh why bitcoin why is bitcoin important to you and how do you think it will change humanity and talk us through what people are writing down before they take the course this like you said this course is 10 weeks long um what are they writing initially and then you have this at the very end of the book that they do this exercise again and talk to us about the the differences that (laughs) of what people are writing here Yes, this is uh, this is one of my favorite things about the book, actually. Um, so it's probably worth worth stating that our target demographic are Salvadorians who are brand new to the space, so they know little or nothing about Bitcoin when they begin. And what that means is the first page, that first blank page, why Bitcoin? 
is mostly left a blank page. They don't know. Like they, they sometimes literally leave it blank. Uh, and if they do write something, then it's like a sentence or two. It's, it's effectively, they just don't know how to answer that when they start the course. And then you can pair that with, with what students write at the end. And this is, so the, the first page, the first blank page is just one page. So then we leave three pages for them. Sometimes students don't have enough room at the end. And they, they, there have been times where they actually staple pages onto that to, so they could, so they could keep writing. And one of, one of the things that we try to do with this course, and, and I think it resonates at least with these, with these super writers at the end, um, is we do not teach trade-in. We do not teach Bitcoin as an instrument to have more dollars. Our focus is Bitcoin is a tool for empowerment, is a tool to take control in your own life. And so that comes across with these students' answers at the end, that this is a way for them to, to be involved, to like be able to create their own future, define their own destiny, which again, so 70% of El Salvador is unbanked. Um, and this is a way to, I hesitate to put too much emphasis on whether someone has a bank account or not, but it's access, right? It's like whether people feel that they have the same tools at their disposal as everyone else or, at their, or if they're at the will of others. And many students get that Bitcoin is a way for them to, to have more control in their own life, to, to, better, to better control their present and therefore their future. I want to uh, go through some of the course material, the, the various uh, chapters that you have, and just kind of talk to you about some of the course exercises that you have, because some of the stories are just fascinating that you were telling me when we were in Miami. Um, so section one, and, and this is another thing that I think is just so profound about the, the course outline that you guys have. You don't even really talk about Bitcoin until the second half of the entire course. So like the person goes through half of this course, this 10 week course, and you haven't even talked about Bitcoin in the first half of it. It's truly teaching people about money, about sovereignty, about all these like really important ideas that I think society has just been, I don't, I don't know if brainwashed is the right word or what, but they just don't even think about these things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so the first, the first chapter in your book is called the power of money. And, um, you start off the, the 10 week course with this piece of candy sitting on a desk. Talk to us about what, what this is, like explain it to, to folks and then explain what the class's takeaway is typically out of this. Yeah. So as you said, we start the, the course, not even talking about Bitcoin, we're talking about money. Uh, and most people never even think about what money is or why money is, right? So one of the things that we do in the class, so, so with much of what we do, we try to make it as interactive as possible. So one of the things that we do with the class is, is we give them a piece of candy and we ask them if they would trade it for $1, one US dollar, which is the currency here in El Salvador, uh, in addition to Bitcoin. And everybody raises their hand. Everybody would trade this little piece of candy for a dollar. And, and who would trade it for one Monopoly dollar? And nobody raises their hand. And that, that is a really powerful way to encourage students to question, right? Encourage students to question why one piece of paper has more value than the other, which is something that they've probably never done before. Like, why why... Is, is this paper and ink more valuable than this paper and ink? It's the fact that we don't question it, which allows that to, to continue, right? And, and so much of what we do is trying to lead students to their own conclusions, but just kind of setting it up for them, making it a little bit easier for them to, to ask themselves the right questions. Uh, so this is it's probably worth worth saying that we are very careful to never dictate to students what is what is right what is wrong what is good what is bad uh, but 
but encourage them to think about these questions for themselves. Because at the end, this actually isn't about Bitcoin. This isn't about Bitcoin education. This is about what that encourages, what that incentivizes. And our ultimate goal is to allow, if our ultimate goal is to allow people to think for themselves, to encourage people to think for themselves, then it's important that that we don't tell them what to think, right? That they have to come to their own conclusion. So we try to prompt that. We try to prompt the right questions, but the students actually come to their own conclusions. I love it. Yeah. Shortly followed by this demo that you have, you immediately get into this idea of scarcity uh, and limited resources and time being an important uh, concept to understand when you're thinking about money. And when I look at just modern society and you're looking at some of the stuff that's happening in Europe, that's happening in the U.S. with respect to energy, and it's it's almost like the world has forgotten this really simple and basic idea of scarcity and there's only so many resources to go around there's only so much time to go around and if we're just printing or making up these fictitious digital units at will and just keep adding them into the economy that there's going to be a run on those very scarce things so when you go through this idea in the classroom i would imagine it's it's I don't know, a little earth shattering, or maybe it's, it's, it's immediately like generating this, uh, this challenging, uh, thought base for people that they're just like, I never thought about it that way. What, yeah. what, what's happening? Yeah. One of, one of the really interesting things is so much of this is obvious in hindsight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's obvious once you ask the question, but we just never ask the question. Like we, we grow up, we grow up in a world in which we just accept, we accept the way things are. We, we, we don't question them and we're not really encouraged to either specifically with money, specifically with money. We're not encouraged to question that we're, we're encouraged to just accept it. And it's actually obvious, right? It's like, once you take a big step back and you remove yourself from this, and, and, and a lot of students get it, right? Like we, we try to encourage them to take that step back and remove themselves and like kind of see it with fresh eyes. And it, it yeah, students, there's like, you, you see it. You see this aha moment that they have. Um, and that aha moment is often, you know, it's often before we even get to Bitcoin. Mm. Because the the... I think it's very important in order to understand the solution, you have to know what the problem is. Amen. Yeah. So, it, amen. Yeah, so, so, so that's really the first half is you're trying to, without forcing them to understand the problem, to get them to think creatively on here is the problem. It's very obvious now, but I've never been afforded the opportunity to think from this vantage point and actually see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's wonderful. And that's empowering. That's empowering, right? To be like, wait, this is this, this is this very important concept that dictates much of my life, which is money, which is synonymous with power. And wait, I could, there's an alternative, like there's, there's, I could be involved with this. Like, this isn't something that I have to be passive about. Like I could be active about this. I could have a say. Like that, that by itself is very empowering. In, in the second section, so moving along in, in the course guide, so you guys, uh, chapter two, uh, you go through the history of money. You start off with bartering, you go to uh, the dollar, you provide this amazing uh, history, you get to CBDCs. But in this section, you have uh, something that you term, uh, this is a popular economics idea, but I don't think I've ever even covered it on this show. Uh, it's it's called the double coincidence of once. Can you explain this simply to the audience and uh, explain how it kind of fits into the history of money picture? Right. Right. So it's not it's not just understanding why money is broken. It's also understanding why money is mm -hmm. right. 
So the double coincidence of wants is a really good example of why money is like money serves a purpose. Uh, if, if we all have different things that we want and different things that we have, and the double coincidence of wants is that it only works if, if what I have is the same thing as what you want, which usually is not the case, right? Like I have, I have mugs and you have books. And you want you want shoes. I don't have that though. Uh, so so we need to find a third person or a fourth person, a fifth person, a sixth person to create this chain to actually arrive at the two of us ending up with the with with the product that each of us wants, S- which doesn't really happen, right? That that's a very cumbersome, inefficient process, which is why we have money. Money money is a it cuts away all that fat and it'll let it allows i forgot what the example was that we're using it allows the the book that you want uh you could you could give me money this this agreed upon thing dollars bitcoin whatever and then i could use that to get the shoes that i want or whatever the other product it is because it's this common denominator in the middle uh that that we all that we all agree as a unit of account um, but but that is something, and you know, there is like an interactive exercise that we do with that, that like students have a piece of paper, what they have and what they want. And like, you just have to try to figure it out in a class of 20, 30 students. And it's a very inefficient process to do that. And then it's like, well, imagine there was something, something in between. Imagine there was something in between, which is what money is. And, and that is something like people don't even realize why we need money in the first place. But but if you explain it to them, and it's not even that complex of a of a concept, right? Especially when you could make it interactive and you could like the students physically get up and they're moving around and trying to find the other person that has this thing that that you want. And it's like, wait, but then I don't have what you want. So I have to make this trade here and there. And and like it becomes very obvious very quickly why we need money, why like the benefit of having money. Um, but again, that's a concept that I never learned in school, right? Yeah. I, I learned that because of Bitcoin, because, you know, after I got into Bitcoin, then I started reading more about what money was and why money was. But it, but it's the same sort of thing. Like, it's not even that complex. It's just something that we never think about. Uh, later in that section, you get into central bank digital currencies. And I think for most people that really aren't dialed into Bitcoin or paying very close attention to this, they're looking at a CBDC and they're just like, well, the, the dollar is already digital or the euro is already digital. I log into my bank account. It's not like I'm actually handling currency. So how is that any different than this central bank digital currency that everybody keeps talking about? How do you guys lay that out in your course? Yeah, so it's about control. Uh, it's it's not it's not about whether it's physical or digital. It's about control. Do you have control, or does somebody else have control? Um, and and here in El Salvador, and this is contextual, right? So in in different environments, then then you would use different things to to teach this lesson. But you know, we're we're not too far from Venezuela here, and there are Venezuelan migrants here. You can't, and people are instinctively aware of this, you can't send dollars to Venezuela easily. You can't send value to Venezuela easily because you need somebody's permission. You need a bank's permission, a government's permission. And people know that. They they know that there are restrictions with their money. And then to show them, again, with, with all the courses in, in an effort to try to make it interactive and show rather than tell, then we have students actually make Bitcoin transactions. Right. So they they're just sending it to the to the person next to them or somebody else in the class. But it's it's a it's a very easy step to be like, and they don't even think about it. So they download a wallet. And, you know, the student next to them downloads a wallet, we'll send them a few sats uh, over lightning, and they'll send it to the next person. And it's an aha thing. They're like, wow, that was so easy. Like, is Bitcoin easy? I didn't think Bitcoin was easy. Uh, you know, before before this moment, I thought it was going to be really complicated. That's really easy. And then you have to usually 
explain to them and break it down even further. Right. So you didn't need your ID for that, right? You didn't need to verify like a bank account for that, right? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. And then when you sent it, did you have to, did it have to go through a process where it passed through someone else? No. So that's direct. You were just sending it to that person and they don't have to be right next to you. They could be in Venezuela. They could be in China. They could be anywhere. And you don't need permission to do it. And they don't need permission either. And it's, and it's something that like when they do it, they have one aha moment of how easy it is. And then when you explain it to them, then they have a second aha moment where they're like, right. Okay. So that's, that's, that's unstoppable. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that, and that is, again, it's, it opens up a whole new world of possibilities because we're so used to someone else having authority over us mm -hmm. and to show people that not only does it not have to be that way, but it's easier than you think mm -hmm. is, is a really powerful combination. Uh, let's go to the, the third chapter that you guys have here. You have discovering the dark side of fiat. And in this section, you get into, I, I love this. You, you force the students, not that you force them, but you have the students go through this exercise of uh, fractional reserve banking. And one of the exercises, you have them take a 10% reserve ratio of a bank and you send it through six different participants in order to create more additional fiat in the money system. I'm curious, as they're doing this drill, this mathematical drill, what are the comments or like, what are the thoughts that, that they're talking about? I'm sure they're blown away that this is how the existing system works because most people don't ever do this in any type of education. Uh, public education process. Right. And it's basically the converse of Bitcoin, right? It's yeah, like, yeah, the more that students learn about Bitcoin, the more confidence they have in it. Mm -hmm. The more students learn about fiat, the less confidence they have in it to be like, wait, so when I put money in a bank, they don't actually like that. That money's gone then. It's like it, it's, yeah, it's, 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 but again, they don't question. That's that's not something that we're taught to question generally. So yeah, the the more they learn about the uh, uh, <laughs> the less confidence they have in it. Yeah, I would imagine they're just like, there's no way this is how this actually works, right? Right. Is that, is that yeah. pretty much the? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it doesn't really. I mean, I don't know. This is a whole different debate that we could talk about. You know, whether the 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 benefits of, of something like that, which I would not be on that side of the debate. I'd be on the other side, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's the financial system that we have doesn't really hold up, right? Like the deeper you probe, the it's less just, things, the less I it mean, is logical. When you perform these calculations, you realize that it's totally, uh, uh, I, impacted by outside forces and the desires of, of a few people pulling the strings and, and conducting these calculations to make sure that there's enough units in the system. And it's like, oops, uh, well, that person's really upset and they're really important. So now I just, you know, I can just sprinkle a few more units in there. And then that issue kind of goes away and you can just see how, uh, uh, influenced the mm -hmm. the legacy system is in this section. I love how you guys lay it out for the students to I mean, why didn't we ever do these calculations in school, right? I mean, <laughs> it has to be by design, right? Um anyway, <laughs> let's go to the let's go to the fourth uh section. This is titled The Future Can Be Decentralized, Empowering Communities and Individuals. In this section, you really get into the abuse of centralized systems. Uh Tell us maybe some stories or anything that that you think is an important highlight from this uh, particular section. Yeah, so this is, I think this is one of the more important chapters, uh, and 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 maybe that's what the whole book is about, and that's what this whole question is about: centralization versus decentralization. And again, students 
understand this without realizing it yet. So some students have talked to us, ones that have had accounts with centralized system, like let's let's keep with money and 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 with banks. They have had people have had their accounts frozen. People have, you know, kind of come up against these systems, these centralized systems, and they have had experiences with it. Um, so they know that they know it without realizing it. And it, it comes up in every part of our life, this centralization versus decentralization question. Most students, again, it's, it's, they don't realize that there's an alternative. Mm. Right? They don't realize that there is, that there is something different. And, and, you know, back to, back to Venezuela, like people have, we have had students that have tried to send money to Venezuela and it's caused them a bunch of hassle, right? It has, it has flagged them and like created headaches for them. Uh, so they already know that's a broken system. They just don't know that there's a different way. So I th- yeah, again, I think in many ways, this is the crux of, of of everything really centralization versus decentralization is 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 the uh, they've is experienced a, it they they can feel it and that they that they've experienced but they haven't necessarily uh maybe understand how capital controls actually work or remittances uh how the, the plumbing of all of that actually works but you lay that out in the course guide and they get you know all the details on how that exactly works um, so let me, let me just say this, John. So here we are, we're halfway through the, the course guide. The students haven't really even played around or talked about Bitcoin at all at this point. What's the general consensus? Are, are people, have you, have you lost many students? Is, is the attendance up? Are they bringing their friends? Like where, where are we at at the halfway point through the course? No, students are generally excited to hear, right? This is, this is a subject that I think people are interested in without knowing. This is this is a brand new concept, but it it's it's interesting because it's a brand new concept for people to to think about money and to think about their relationship with money. And it's interesting because it's a brand new concept, but it's also something that is so relative to their own lives that they could feel that they could that they could see how it affects them. Usually it's one or the other. Usually things that affect us so much, we're familiar with. Mm-hmm. And things that we're unfamiliar with don't affect us that much. This is that rare case where it's something that, you know, students see like, this has real effect on me, on my own life, and I don't know anything about it. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, oh, I want to learn more. Let's let's keep going. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, so... Chapter five, you're getting into the future of money. You're talking about Bitcoin. You introduce cryptography. And I'm just, you know, I've been talking about cryptography and Bitcoin for many years at this point. So it's not something that I really even think about all that much. But I'm sure for a person who's never been introduced to cryptography or how any of this works, it may be a little overwhelming for them to see this and say like, what the heck are we even talking about? And how in the world is this money? Uh, what, what is the, I guess, how is, how is it received when you do start to dive into it? Cause it gets very technical, very tech. And, and you lay it all out in the, in the multiple chapters that follow, but I'm sure for a lot of people, it's overwhelming at first. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think the, the the book does a great job generally not just here but throughout of uh, breaking down complex topics in a way that is easy to understand and i want to i want to shout out dahlia platt and the whole curriculum team for for doing an excellent job there um so this you know you talk about the difficulty of this right about this particular chapter but I think you could be, you could say the same thing for the for the whole course. I believe that we underestimate ourselves. We underestimate humanity. 
this is pretty high level stuff, but the assumption in much of the world is yeah, it's too much for you. You can't handle this. Our assumption is the opposite. Our assumption is you can. Our assumption is that you are capable of, of understanding these high level concepts. And what we have found, we, we have found that to be true, right? That's been proven true. People, you know, we teach this in high schools. So it's like 16 years old, 17 years old. Well, we teach it. We also have open enrollment. We have a house that is effectively a school and office for us. Uh, we teach it out of community centers. And, and you know, we have people who are great grandparents that come and, and they learn about this. Um, it, it is... Yeah, so I would I would imagine after you teach section five, that first uh, lesson that when you guys are done with the instruction, there's just all these people hanging around like with 100 more questions at the end of the of the lesson. Is that what you're seeing? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Again, this kind of depends a bit on the setting. So when we teach it in a high school setting, then maybe, they, you know, they don't have time afterwards. They have to go to the next thing. Um, but not only do they have questions which is true, but they want to share what they learned. One, one of my favorite things is, so we have these graduations at the end and, uh, and, you know, so it's in, it's in a school. We usually only have the graduations if it's in a public school and you see students and you could identify who the students are because we'll give them a, a t-shirt, right? That's like, they pass this test at the end and, and that gets a t-shirt, like I made it, whatever. Um, so you know who the students are and who the other students are at the high school who haven't gone through this course. And just walking around, you know, you go to the bathroom, you go to get like some water or whatever. Then you see all these little micro interactions of people who have taken the course who are really excitedly telling their peers about things that they've learned, concept, concepts that they learned. Um, and, and that is... That is one of one of my favorite things to see is to see not just that students are able to absorb this knowledge, but they're able to disseminate it as well. I just wanted to jump in here and tell you about this new valuable resource that we created for you. The biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns, and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan, and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. If you're not satisfied with where you're at financially, whether that be not having enough savings at the end of each month, watching your cash being eroded away by inflation, or maybe you're not sure where to get started with investing. Down in the description below, we put together a free guide for you called the four simple steps to take control of your personal finances and life. You can get this free guide by clicking the link in the description below. Uh, let's go to the, uh, the case. Okay, so chapter six, you get into self custody versus custodial services. And you talk about lightning uh, for the first time here. And just going through the material, and I'm trying to look at it with the beginner's mindset or eye, right? And I'm just like, man, this this is really, there's a lot to this, right? We talk about it all the time and you just kind of lose sight of like how complex a lot of this is. And when I'm looking at it in the course material, I'm saying, man, this would be so overwhelming for a person to see for the first time and just kind of come to grips with what is this? Um I guess my first question for you is on the self custody side. Do do you get the the inclination that the students view uh, custodial services as being evil on their own? Because I know you don't lay it out that way in the guide. You just you present it in a way that hey, there's this, there's that. How do how do most of the students view cust like self custody? It's mixed, right? Um, yeah. So you know, here in El Salvador, uh, people are usually familiar with Chiba wallet, mm -hmm. which is a, a self, no, sorry, not self custody, but, uh, custodial. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's a custodial wallet. Uh, and that's, that's a reference point for a lot of people. And a lot of people come to the course with an opinion about that already. 
So it, if their opinion is already positive about that, then maybe they don't see it as such a bad thing. If their opinion is already negative about that, then they're like, yep, I knew it. <laughs> this gives me a framework for, for identifying why I didn't like it. Uh, so, so that is, that is a bit mixed. Um, but it trends towards people not liking it. Right. And, 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 and the further into the course they go, it trends further in that direction. And I mean, people can still withdraw uh, their Bitcoin out of the Chiva wallet to whatever wallet they want that could be a self-custody lightning wallet. Do you find after this chapter that they're like, I'm getting my my funds out of Chiva if they had it there? Or um, is it just a, a just a broader awareness or, or education on what they currently have versus what they could have? Yeah. So a big part of it is, and yes, I think a lot of people do, you know, start using alternatives to, to Chivo after this. But part of that is because they didn't know there was an alternative before that. Mm -hmm. So like Chivo is kind of the default option here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and this is only for the older students because you have to be 18, 18 and above to, to use Chivo. Uh, so this doesn't apply to high school students, but for the open enrollment courses, if they do have a Bitcoin wallet already, then it's likely Chivo. And yes, less of them use Chivo afterwards, but I think part of that, I don't think they become like crusaders against it, but they weren't even aware of the differences between that and and other products. So just that basic awareness that they have is inevitably inevitably going to lead them to to you know reduce that market share what's the general consensus after they learn about the lightning network are some of them surprised that they didn't even realize they were using layer two with chivo yeah yeah people don't really it, it, it's such a it's such a it's such a great thing to watch because you know um I learned about Bitcoin first and then lightning was this thing that came afterwards. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, it's, it's very clearly separated because mm -hmm. lightning didn't even exist yeah. in the first place. But now here in El Salvador, people use lightning. People don't really use on chain. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Starbucks and you want to buy a coffee or whatever, it's with lightning. People aren't using on chain and they don't, they, Think of them much more interchangeably than I do. Mm. I separate them a lot more in my head than they do. They they think of same like, here as as Bitcoin, basically. They're like Lightning, yeah, Bitcoin, yeah whatever. Bitcoin, same. yeah, <laughs> they're Bitcoin, right? <laughs> like, I love it. I just I love all the graphics that you guys have in the uh, course guide, and I mean there is there's no stone left unturned, and uh, you go into so much detail, and I love the course exercises that that have the students do the work, like they go through, like you have a section on proof of work in the section eight with mining, and I mean you're just you're forcing them to really kind of get their hands dirty on how this actually works, why it actually works. So, John, uh, at the end of the course, when you're all done here, do you find that the students are really proud of being an El Salvador citizen for figuring this out before everybody else in the world? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So, so you know, I had mentioned the, the graduations that we have. Um, and what we do with the graduation after they finish the course, then we bring in people to verify their knowledge. And these sometimes are Salvadorians, but sometimes they're foreigners. These are people who, who are already well-versed on Bitcoin. It's actually sometimes former students that come back to do this part. Um, but as part of the ceremony, we, we talk about that. We talk about you know, how important what's happening here is, how important what's happening in El Salvador is. Like El Salvador is the tip of the spear. And then within that, you are, right? You are this first 
generation in the First Nation to learn about this, to have this knowledge as part of a normal aspect of your life. And that will change everything. You will change everything. You are the precedent. You are the example. And they feel it. And they really feel it. Like, I think at most, if not all of the graduations that I've been to, at least some of the students have cried. Mm. They've, they've cried at like the moment that they're in at the, you know, whether they're, they're hugging their teacher when they get the certificate and they're crying, but they go back and they, they go to their mom or their dad and they hug them and tears in their eyes. Uh, because this is, Again, it's about empowerment. They haven't, they are feeling their own power maybe for the first time in their own life. They they are feeling their own importance, that they matter, right? Like that, that's one of the things that that we that we like to try to impart is that you matter, right? You matter. This is your life, your decision, your sovereignty, your destiny, your future you see that at every graduation, like the students, they, they feel it in, in, in ways that they, that maybe they're not used to feeling it. It's awesome. They're, they're feeling empowered. Yeah. Um, what are you guys doing to expand this? Because when I'm looking at the course guide and I'm looking at, uh, I mean, this whole movement is about education. It really is like, you can't, you can't move this forward without people a, understanding the problem, like you said earlier, and then B, understanding the solution, which is where I get really frustrated, especially with legacy finance, because it's like, how can't you see the solution? It's practically hitting people in the face. Um, and it's an education gap. People have to be able to wrap their head around the nuances of this to truly understand why it's so revolutionary, why they can't be debased, and why it stores their savings on a long term tail you know there's going to be volatility along the way but if you can you can store your savings in this it's it's going to be just empowering for them uh so how can how can you guys expand this are you guys expanding this uh just give us a glimpse as to what you guys got in in the future here yes yes that's a great question um we can expand it we are expanding it we will expand it and the way that our strategy for that is, is our strategy for everything is to empower others. So the book that we're talking about and, and everything that we do um, is either open source now or will be open source. So the Bitcoin Diploma is open source. Every time we have a new edition, it's open source. You can find it on the website or our GitHub. Uh, and we are also, this is at the moment of recorded, not yet released, but by the time the, the recording is live. I, I presume it will be in that in that interim. Uh, we'll release our vision statement, which is this three part process. The first part is what we're doing in El Salvador. So that is to demonstrate that Bitcoin education could be a tool for empowerment at mass scale. The second part of that, which is something that that's already happening is to empower others to do it in their own communities. So we are working, and this is just people who have reached out to us. We've never advertised this. We've never, this is literally the first time that I'm saying it publicly. Um, but people have reached out to us from places around the world, whether it's Bitcoin and Cassie in South Africa or Omniage in Honduras or so many others. And they are teaching the Bitcoin Diploma where they are in their own way that fits best for the local context. And we're trying to encourage that and speed that up and ensure a high quality of that. So we, we are linking teachers who have experienced with it, who have gone through it with teachers who are teaching it for the first time so they can share best practices. Uh, we're, we're trying to create um, multi-directional communication channels between these different nodes in the network. So, so you can share best practices, not just not just from one teacher to another, but one accountant to another, one one manager to another. You know, just 
just in the different facets that it takes to to uh, to make this successful. Um, and then the the third part is to create a space where we could all come together because Bitcoin education, independent, impartial, community-led Bitcoin education is something we can all support. We all come at Bitcoin from different angles, with different perspectives. We have different, we have different end goals, but this is something that we can all align on, right? This is common ground for all of us. And so we want to create that space where we could all come together there. So it's just this three-pronged strategy that we have. But it all starts with creating a positive example here. That's that's the basis of everything. The basis of, of our scale-in philosophy is not for us to go to other places, other parts of the world and do the same thing. It's to help others do it there. It's to, it, it's to encourage others to do it where they already are. They know the local context. Um, and it's about decentralization, right? That's That's a whole... That that opens up a whole can of worm, worms if we are if we are actually doing this everywhere like that 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 becomes centralized then right so the the whole point of this is to empower others and that in, and that that means the students that we teach it means the people that work for the project here in El Salvador but it also means the people that want to do something similar wherever they are. All of this is about creating positive examples and empowering others to take control of their own life, their own situation. Well, John, I so the PDF that I'm looking at, the whole course guide is open source and people can go into the show notes. We are going to have a link in the show notes that will take people to the page where they can view this outline that I'm looking at, which is mind blowing how, how incredible this outline is. Um, even if you don't plan on showing this to anybody, just having it for yourself to go through in reference is insanely valuable. I cannot recommend it enough to go into the show notes to what you're listening right now and just click on the link to, to go to what, uh, they have made. It is phenomenal, phenomenal. My next question for you is what should someone do? If they're listening to this and they want to get involved and they're, they're hearing this and they're saying, I've got to do something similar for my local area, or can I donate some money to, to help this organization succeed even more than what they already are? Like, what is the call to action here for somebody who's listening and wants to, to assist or help in any way that they can? Yeah. So our objective is to change the world. And because that is so broad, we need all, all the help that we could get. And that help comes in a variety of different ways. Like the, the, the simplest way is, is, is money, right? It's, it's just to donate. You could donate uh, on our webpage, which is myfirstbitcoin.io. Um, or we have, a, we have an open campaign on Geyser, on the Geyser platform. So either of those are great ways to donate. You want to if you have some spare sats, and that's very helpful. Uh, other ways to help, and and we we have we try to stick to an order of priorities, and one is the mission, two is the project, and three is the individual. So if you could help the mission, and the mission is to reimagine what's possible by allowing and encouraging people to think for themselves, have agency in their own lives, take control over their present, therefore their future. That's it. That's all you have to do, right? And 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 we'll we have a toolkit that that we share with people that reach out to us that are interested in doing just that. Um and we could connect you with other people who are doing similar things in in other places to make it easier to, to do that on your own. Uh, and just, you know, all our materials are open source. We're actually, the, the long-term plan is open source everything. So it's not just the Bitcoin diploma, it's also our accountant practices. It's also how we 
do marketing, how we make internal decisions, all that stuff. So it's just, and again, people will, people will do it in their own way, but to create a framework and a guideline to help people get started, because the first step is very often the hardest. Uh, yeah. So the call to action is do donate if you can. Do come to El Salvador and see it for yourself if you can. Do join the project, reach out to us. And if you have a special skill, like you could help with translations, with web design, with literally anything that whatever, whatever you're great at, and, and you could donate your, your skills, your, your time, your energy, your passion, then that is super helpful to us because we need so many different, so many different um, skills. And then the third part is you are, you can do this in your own community. This is a global movement. This is El Salvador is the Genesis block, but it's not the only one. El Salvador is the example. The mission is the world. Yeah. Not thank you enough for doing this. And uh, for folks that are listening, click on the show notes. Look at this guide. Uh, you're going to spend five minutes flipping through this guide and you're going to see what, what I'm talking about and how profound this is and how important this project is with just uh, very little effort here, folks. So uh, go into that. Please click on the link. Check it out. And John, thank you for making time and thank you for your amazing efforts down there. Uh, this has been a real treat to be able to talk to you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Just just I want to give a quick shout out to the team we are doing on Twitter right now, which is my first Bitcoin underscore. We are doing a share your story campaign because the team, which is about 20, 25 people here in El Salvador, they all are doing such incredible work. And this is, you know, the product of so many different minds, so much labor from so many different people. And and everyone is sharing their story, how they arrived at this point. And you know, we're we're a couple of days into the campaign. And it's 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 so inspiring, even for me. And and like I I know these people, right? But it's still to to read what brought them here and like why they're doing this. It it is it's really inspiring. And and I would love to get more eyeballs on on this, the individual personal stories of everyone on the team and, and, um, and yeah, why, why they want to change the world and how they're already doing it. I love it. We'll have a link to the Twitter as well. John, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. People don't need to understand every nuance about Bitcoin to understand that it's better money, right? They'll just feel that it preserves their purchasing power over time better. Just the same way that people don't need to understand like the mathematical equations behind inflation for that to influence their behavior. Bitcoin adoption will grow because people will sort of feel and understand that it's better money, even if they haven't sort of sat down and like read all the books or understand all of the background information. And that's the hope, right? The same thing that's driving them to say, oh, I need to buy the new TV or I need to like get a new car right now. Instead of thinking about that differently, the opposite will happen too as people start adopting Bitcoin.